Debbie, I don't need to say that since you've already been here. Um, we are the, um, uh, a, shorter, a shorter panel. There's just uh, two uh, speakers uh, here, but they are uh, looking to be very interesting. So I'll just do brief introductions and then Major uh, Jennifer Newhauser will do her presentation, and then Professor Victor Hansen will do his presentation. And then, to the extent that we have time left over, we'll take, uh, or they will take some questions. Uh, Major Newhauser is an uh, Army State, Army State, United States Army JAG officer, Chief of Administrative and Civil Law at Fort Car Carson, Colorado. And she, um, before going to law school, she was um, an ordnance officer and an enlisted soldier. She's served in Iraq, she served in Germany, um, and she is going to speak on lives of quiet desperation, the conflict between military necessity and confidentiality. Professor Victor Hansen teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, evidence, and prosecutorial ethics at New England Law in Boston. He was also in the JAG Corps uh, and um, was Regional Defense Counsel for the United States Army Trial Defense Service uh, in um, the capacity as both a prosecutor and a defense attorney, uh, and also um, doing not just um, criminal litigation, but def uh, capital litigation. So, um, Major Newhauser? Hi, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to once again thank you guys for your hospitality, uh, particularly the students from the Law Review. Uh, Jordan, who I've been calling Mr. Clemente for the past five months, um, that may or may not be related to why I'm situated at the end of the day after that dynamic panel. So um, you can draw your own conclusions. <laughs> this is more of a, uh, a serious subject. I'm talking about uh, protected health information in the military system. First of all, I'd like to start out with some statistics. Uh, you know, as I'm sure you guys know, over two million soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen have deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan since we started this war. And as I'm sure many of you know, uh, a lot of us have returned from downrange with some significant psychic wounds, so much so that the military has been desperately seeking uh, ways to address these issues. Our, Viet our experiences in Vietnam have shown us that you know, we can't afford to turn a blind eye to these wounds, even if they're invisible to the naked eye. And the, si the central argument of my paper is that there are some statutory and regulatory uh, schemes that are designed to, make, to help commanders make informed choices about what to do with these service members with psychological issues are actually getting in the way of treatment um, because they're forcing our service members to make a perceived choice between their career and getting the help that they desperately need. Uh, here's some more statistics. Uh, the mental health advisory team report, these are the latest statistics I was able to find online. And basically what the MHAT is, is uh, the Army's method of assessing how we're dealing with psychological issues both in and out of theater. As you can see, a significant chunk of soldiers report having psychological symptoms uh, in theater. And this can be anything from sleeplessness and anxiety all the way up to full-blown PTSD. And though these statistics are troubling, uh, there's even an even more troubling report in the New England Journal of Medicine that says between 20 and 50 percent of service members uh, redeploying from theater report psychological problems. However, only 40 percent of that affected population is actually getting treatment. Um, now, obviously, some, sometimes those symptoms abate on their own, and there's no need for those service members to get counseling. But as you can see from the last bullet there, um, there are significant barriers to getting mental health treatment in the, in the military. Uh, there's a stigma. We are obviously a macho culture. Um, and at the end of the day, there's always going to be some stigma associated with getting mental health treatment. There's a Department of the Army pamphlet that is issued to leaders addressing uh, this issue. And it states that military training, culture, institutional structures, and policies stick foster stigma and prevent individuals from seeking care because they fear using services 
may limit their career, military career prospects and cause them to be viewed as weak or unreliable. So the Army and the military as a whole acknowledges that we have a problem. However, in the same breath, Army officials are saying that privacy and mental health treatment cannot be guaranteed because there's always a risk that an unbalanced soldier may jeopardize the mission. Uh, therefore, the military health care system is designed to guarantee that commanders will always have access to medical records if they determine that it might affect the military mission. Now, how do we do that? Obviously, uh, most of Americans are familiar with HIPAA. In the military, our version of HIPAA is DOD uh, Instruction 6025.18-R. I'm just going to call it the instruction. Um, and it's in effect for all medical treatment facilities with some minor exceptions. And like HIPAA, there's a general prohibition on sharing protected health information, PHI, except for specifically permitted disclosures. Um, the medical treatment facility is required to make, quote, reasonable efforts to limit the use, disclosure, or request of PHI to the minimum necessary to accomplish the use, disclosure, or request of protected health information. However, in the military, there's a catch. Both uh, the DOD instruction and the Army regulation, 40-66, allow disclosure of protected health information um, without the service member's consent for this last bullet, for activities deemed necessary by appropriate military command authorities to assure the proper execution of the military mission. Not only that, but uh, they allow disclosure without a service member's consent for both administrative and judicial proceedings without a court order. So, for example, if you have a soldier who's facing non-judicial punishment for minor misconduct, like talking back to a supervisor or being late to uh, work, he could potentially lose, he, his records could be accessed by that chain of command if they feel that there's some nexus there. And they don't really have to prove that nexus to anybody, they just have to state it. Uh, what can be frustrating for military law practitioners is that there is really no standard for what quote, proper execution of the military mission is. For the military, it can be anything from fixing a Humvee to capturing Saddam Hussein. And the definition of command authorities in the regulation includes everything from commanders, inspectors general, attorneys, military personnel officers, criminal investigation d d command, or military police investigators. And that's just, that list is um, not exclusive. As Michelle McClure, who was uh, the executive director of the National Institute of Military Justice said, uh, these exceptions are so vague and so broad that you could practically drive a truck through them. And so we have to look at what are, who are the actors in the system? Why would a soldier be concerned about the confidentiality of his medical records? And why would a commander care whether or not Sergeant Jones is in counseling? And how do the healthcare practitioners, mainly psychotherapists, react to these competing motivations? We've already briefly discussed uh, the stigma of mental health counseling. Again, this is a macho culture. Our kind of, you know, one of our favorite sayings is suck it up and drive on. And I think for the most part, it serves us well. We don't want some ranger in Kandahar who's got a hump a ruck for, you know, 50 clicks to complain about a hangnail. But, it's difficult to turn that attitude off. Um, sometimes we eat our young and we eat our weak. Uh, in the same guide I'd mentioned before, it states, one of the greatest barriers to preventing suicide is a culture that shames soldiers into believing it is not safe to get help. Now there is no denying that our culture and the stigma against getting mental health treatment are linked. And then up here, I, I talk about security clearance concerns. No matter how often our leaders assure us that getting treatment is going to be viewed positively, we as soldiers can't help but wonder, why are they asking? Uh, question 21 on the National Security Clearance Questionnaire asks if, in the past seven years, have you sought mental health counseling? Recently, that was amended to exclude trauma at trauma, but you know, they're still asking about treatment. They're not asking about symptoms. And AR, Army Regulation 380-67, which sets the standards for granting or denying uh, clearances, they say, any behavior or illness, including any mental condition that causes a defect in judgment or reliability, 
may be grounds for a denial of clearance. So if at any time a commander thinks that your judgment may be impaired, he can pull your clearance. And at least for officers, we have to maintain at least a secret clearance in order to have our jobs. And last but not least, uh, we have well-meaning but intrusive commanders. Uh, these are not inherently evil people. Uh, you know, for the past five years, as the suicide rate in the military has surpassed that of the civilian population, there's been this constant drumbeat from our leaders. They say, do something, do something, do something. So one commander down in Fort Benning, his solution was to put all of his soldiers who were in counseling to make them wear bright orange road guard vests around posts so his non-commissioned officers could easily identify at-risk soldiers. Um, that's a little stigmatizing. Uh, in, in my paper, I cite an interview with a battalion commander who proposes that a list be drawn up of soldiers in counseling and uh, they would be denied access to weapons. Now, these aren't suicidal or homicidal soldiers. These are soldiers in counseling, and this is an infantry battalion. Now, speaking of commanders, we're talking about the whole do something culture in the military. It's kind of part of our DNA. Commanders, by regulation, are responsible for a soldier's state of readiness at all times. And they may reason that what better way to be able to assess a soldier's state of readiness than to have access to his medical records. Uh, they have to be able to know whether or not their soldiers can deploy. And most importantly, they're responsible for personnel who control lethal force. Males aged 17 to 26 make up 50% of the active force. And historically, suicide has been the second most uh, common reason for death in this age group, uh, right after accidents. The Department of the Army has said categorically that commanders have a legitimate need to know about the mental and physical capabilities of their soldiers in order to safely and effectively carry out their mission. But we have to ask ourselves, is that the same thing as giving commanders access to medical records, and specifically mental health treatment records? Now you have to consider the tools that are available at a commander's disposal. If a soldier starts acting out, uh, it's behaving irrationally, they can always refer that soldier to what's uh, called a command-directed mental health referral, um, which can lead to inpatient treatment. And that doesn't require access to the soldier's records. But before deployment and before every permanent change of station move we have, we go through readiness process, and that's where healthcare providers they, view, they screen our records and they determine, you know, if there's some significant issues that need to be addressed. And again, that doesn't require giving commanders access to medical records. But perhaps most significantly, it's the eight hours a day, eight plus hours a day, five days a week, more if we're deployed, that we spend together as soldiers. We, we work together as a team and we learn how to look out for each other. And you have to compare those 40 hours a week to the one hour, you know, every other week or so that that soldier is in therapy. And finally, we come to the healthcare providers themselves. It's not easy to be a psychotherapist in uniform. Um, you have to know that when your client deploys, he's going to have access to firearms and ammunition. And deployment of soldiers with mental health issues often increases the, the risk of self-harm due to the availability of firearms and ammunition. <coughs> Studies have shown conclusively that the presence of a firearm in the home uh, dramatically increases the risk of a completed suicide, obviously. So there's an expectation that if a soldier is at risk, those healthcare providers, those psychotherapists are going to inform the commanders of the risk. They have a duty both to uh, the commander and they have a duty to the mission, but also they have a duty to the client. Uh, psychotherapists are required by codes of ethics to, and by law uh, to maintain confidentiality of the information uh, their client shares. And in order for therapy to work, there has to be a rapport between themselves and their client. How can there be a rapport developed if that soldier is afraid that that psychotherapist is going to turn around and tell the commander? Or, you know, what can be more likely if that commander chooses to access that soldier's records. Now, you know, consider, for example, what happens when that psychotherapist breaks privilege. You know, if they say something like, the soldier can't deploy, 
That soldier can lose their clearance, they could potentially uh, lose their job, and if they're administratively separated from the military, they could lose their health insurance. So it's a catastrophic effect. And lastly, the, you know, those psychotherapists in uniform, they have those commanders requesting access, that might be their boss. So it's, it's difficult uh, for them to make those types of choices when there's that divide loyalty. Um, you know, and when, oops. when we talk about accessing uh, soldiers' mental health records, we have to look at a, a cost-benefit analysis. What's the harm that we are seeking to prevent? Well, obviously, we're trying to prevent arming uh, potentially homicidal or suicidal individuals. And what means are we using to prevent it? We are granting commanders wholesale access to soldiers' medical records, and we're linking security clearances uh, to mental health treatment. And what is the cost? The cost is that we're deterring potentially thousands of service members from getting the mental health treatment they need uh, because they're concerned about their boss finding out or the, about they're losing their clearance. And the bottom line is, is there anything that is related to a soldier's fitness for duty or deployment that cannot be gathered through thoughtful leadership and observation. Uh, and we have to ask ourselves, well, how likely is the scenario going to be? We have a soldier that's in dis distress who's seeing a counselor. The command is unaware of that soldier's distress, and that soldier goes out and harms himself for the mission. Or, you know, if by granting commanders access to medical records or mental health records is preventing this harm we're seeking um, to avoid, what situations would arise where granting that commander unfettered access to his records um, changes the situation? Because at the, at the end of the day, therapists have a, are bound by codes of ethics and state laws to notify authorities if they think that soldier is going to be at risk of self-harm or harming others. And I just want to bring this up. We really are trying as a military. Every day there is a new initiative um, to, to change things, to change uh, the stigma in our culture, to help those soldiers get help. I'm, I'm just saying we're not there yet. Um, for me, the bottom line is, you know, for example, there is a study where almost 2,000 1,965 service members were, uh, who had been identified with psychological issues were surveyed and they had already been identified as having psychological problems. 43% of that population said that they consider their career a significant barrier to getting treatment. 23% uh, said they thought their chain of command would find out about what they'd be sharing in therapy and 40, another 43% uh, said that they were worried about losing their clearance. Now, that's 844 people who potentially did not get treatment uh, because they were concerned about their careers. And this is kind of the thesis of my paper. Um, what should we do? Uh, we, we need to take a calculated risk and remove the absolute right of access to medical records for judicial and administrative hearings and uh, to accomplish the military mission. <clears throat> uh, this policy creates distrust among soldiers and frankly it's not needed. Uh, commanders already have the uh, mental health referral system and therapists are required by law and by codes of ethics to notify people if they think the soldier is going to harm themselves or harm others. Um, what we really need to do is address the greater risk that a soldier is going to choose to forego treatment uh, and therefore goes unhelped and unmonitored. I, I propose an absolute th privilege uh, between soldiers and therapists be created, um, except in cases of self-harm, uh, harm of others, or uh, judicial order, or of course the mental health referral that I talked about previously. These privileges already exist. We already have uh, privilege between soldiers and chaplains and soldiers and attorneys. Um, and you know, briefly, the, the, the three command, the contra examples I have up there, Private Carmat, uh, Sergeant 
Russell and Major Hassan. Uh, I kind of talk about it in my paper, but briefly, uh, Sergeant Russell, for example, he's the individual who was involved in the Camp Liberty shootings. He shot five personnel um, while he's being treated at a combat stress clinic. The, his leadership already knew that he was priving problems. They removed the bolt from his weapon, so there's nothing that could have been prevented or avoided by giving that commander access to his mental health treatment records. Major Hassan, wasn't, who's was involved in the Fort Hood shootings, wasn't even in therapy. He was one of the ones who were supposed to be identifying these at-risk soldiers. Um, so, you know, bottom line is we take a calculated risk. We allow soldiers to know that they can get treatment in a discreet and confidential manner. And we'll save far more people than these far-fetched, highly unlikely scenarios where giving commander unfettered access to their medical records and their mental health treatment records is going to either save national security or prevent these tragedies. Um, and you know, only then will we let soldiers truly know that getting help is a sign of strength rather than a sign of weakness. Thank you. All right, well, good afternoon. I guess uh, you would call me the speed bump, um, the, last, the last one on the panel. I'm, I'm used to uh, following uh, Jeff Korn's uh, brilliance. He and I taught together at the JAG School, and I was often in his shadow there. And last summer, I taught a course with John Radson in London, and you can imagine how fun that was to follow him every morning. Um, his antics haven't changed. He's a very entertaining speaker. And thank you for inviting me to, uh, to Creighton. I'm, enjoy being back here. I used, when I was stationed at Fort Riley, Kansas a number of years ago, I used to come to, to Creighton a couple times a year to interview for the JAG course, so it's fun to be back. So the focus of my uh, paper and discussion briefly here today is to pick up a theme that I think has recurred through a number of the presentations we've heard today, and it's this issue of legitimacy. We've heard it in a number of different contexts, legitimacy in the international arena, legitimacy among our allies, legitimacy uh, perhaps among our enemies or former enemies, and uh, I want to take up that theme but talk about it in a different context, and, and that's with regard to the legitimacy of the Uniform Code of Military Justice and our criminal justice system with respect to ourselves, uh, those who are in that system, and with the public who sends their sons and daughters to, to serve in the armed forces and the legitimacy of that system to those of us in democracy who provide the forces uh, to serve. Uh, and the area I want to focus on specifically, and the area that my paper focuses on, is the notion of how a military jury is selected. And to begin with, I'll use just a couple of terms so that, um, uh, that if I lapse into one or another, you'll still know what I mean. Uh, first of all, uh, commander, we all understand that a commander is, is a person who has a legal, and in essence, a statutory responsibility over the soldiers or forces under his or her command. Um, but with that, authority often comes, in addition to just general ability to order and control those forces, uh, comes some degree of authority under the Uniform Code of Military Justice to impose discipline on those soldiers. Um, so a term that's often used interchangeably with commander is convening authority. And what we mean by convening authority is the authority, the commander who has the authority under the Uniform Code to convene a court martial against a soldier. So that's one term to, to kind of keep straight. The other term in the military parlance, we don't call them juries, we call them panels, military panels. But in essence, they are the military version of a jury. Now, in the military, how the process works for selecting a jury is very different, um, at least at the initial stage at the veneer stage, if you will, of how, how that jury is selected. In the, in the civilian system, we're familiar that it's a relatively random process. Uh, voters lists, uh, Department of Motor Vehicles lists, those kinds of lists are used to compile names and names are brought in. In the military, it's much different. Uh, the, mem the members who will serve on a military panel are hand-picked by the convening authority, by the commander, by the same individual who determines whether or not the soldier is going to go to trial. And if they're to go to trial, what charges they're going to be faced with. Um, the criteria under Article 25 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice that a commander is to use in selecting those to serve on the panel 
is to select members in his, who, in his opinion, are, quote, best qualified for the duty by reason of age, education, training, experience, length of service, and judicial temperament. Well, obviously, it doesn't take uh, much to imagine if we're talking about on issues of legitimacy, that can raise some real concerns. Uh, we can anticipate or envision a commander who can manipulate that process or pick those individuals who he or she believes are going to decide the case the way the commander would want them to decide that. So there is the potential uh, in this system, I think, for great mischief. I'm not saying that it exists frequently. In fact, my experience has been the opposite, that it doesn't uh, occur frequently. I think it's relatively infrequent that commanders manipulate or abuse this authority, but it can happen. Now, currently there are some protections under the Uniform Code to, uh, to somewhat uh, protect against excessive abuse, uh, one of them being Article 37 of the Uniform Code, which prevents a commander from taking any adverse action on anybody, any member who serves on a military court-martial for the decisions or the actions that they took on that court-martial. There's also a, a very robust body of case law under, under military courts that have established uh, notions of uh, implied prejudice and actual prejudice and evaluating a commander's uh, selections uh, decisions to determine whether or not they violate those principles. Nonetheless, uh, in spite of these protections, Article 25 still exists and we still have this system where commanders handpick the, the panels that will, will decide the issues of guilt or innocence and also will decide what, uh, what punishment to impose. Now there has been, uh, over time, a lot of proposals put forward to amend this system. And many of these proposals are uh, part of a larger debate that uh, Major Rosenblatt referred to earlier in his comments regarding the, the balance between the rights of the individual and the needs of the military, generally speaking. Uh, and I think that the, this, this debate over the panel member selection has probably been the tip of the spear, if you will, of that debate. Most of the proposals up to this point, in fact, every serious proposal that's been uh, put forward up to this point uh, to, to change the, the process that's been used is to move to some form of random uh, jury selection, random panel selection. Not random, perhaps, in the way that we would see in a civilian system, but much more random than it currently is and either remove Article 25 or significantly amend Article 25. And, and this debate and these proposals have been put forward really for, since, since the, literally since the ink was dry on the Uniform Code in 1951. But for a lot of reasons, uh, these proposals or this specific proposal for random selection hasn't gained really any traction within the military. And in, my, in the paper I look at asking why that is, and I certainly think one reason is just tradition. I mean, militaries, as organizations, we, we tend to be hidebound by tradition and we don't like change. That's something that we're not used to. So perhaps it's that, but I think there's some deeper reasons or resistance against making these changes. And I should say, this resistance occurs in spite of the fact that we have seen in many other countries who have a similar common law tradition particularly in the last 20 to 30 years, have significantly revamped their military justice system to the extent that, uh, in essence, the commander is, is virtually removed from the military justice system. And decisions on who to select as jurors, uh, what cases to try, what charges to bring, are made not by a commander but by other independent bodies, some civilian, some military, but a degree of separation from the commander. But we haven't gone in that direction. Uh, and I think there's some, actually some legitimate reasons why we haven't and why I would suggest we should not go in that direction. Tradition isn't one of them, but I think some legitimate concerns are, first of all, we have to appreciate or recognize the unique role that a commander plays in the military justice system. Uh, military justice system is a system, it's a tool, it's a commander's tool. So philosophically, it's, it starts at a different premise than we would see in a civilian system. It's a commander's tool or a portion of the, uh, the commander's tool to main di maintain discipline within the unit. Now, military officers are trained to primarily assert control over their soldiers, over their uh, 
members of their command by positive leadership, by example, by support, uh, by doing some of the things that have been mentioned here about being concerned about uh, their health and welfare. And that's how primarily commanders assert that authority. But occasionally that doesn't work and commanders must resort to discipline. And a commander, in my opinion, needs to have the ability to tap into a disciplinary system and, and, and really be at the focal point of that system to make sure that it serves its proper purpose. So I think that's one reason why it doesn't make sense to remove the commander from this process. I think another significant reason is there's this principle of international law. It's, it's, it's gained acceptance and interestingly the United States has been a, a very strong proponent of it post World War II and it's this notion of command responsibility. That being that a commander uh, by virtue of his or her authority as a commander uh, has, an, has a duty to ensure the law of that their, the forces under their command comply with the law of war. And if they don't, if the, command fa if the commander fails in that responsibility, that, it's, that failure by those forces under that command is largely attributed, attributed to the commander's failings. And in essence, the commander can be punished as, as if he or she actually committed those offenses, whether they did so or not. Now, um, if we remove the commander from the, the ability to make decisions over discipline and ensure that their soldiers comply with the law of war, but still impose this obligation upon them, I think that's a, we lose some important symmetry in the law. So that's another reason why I think it's important not to remove the commander from this decision. And I think another primary reason why uh, a random selection process or some kind of quasi-random selection process hasn't been adopted is primarily operational concerns or operational needs and the difficulty of identifying uh, soldiers who could be available to sit on courts martial. Sometimes in the military, oftentimes for example in the army, courts martial panels sit not for one case but oftentimes for several months. So they might hear all of the cases that come up over a, a five or six month period. And uh, of course if it's, it's, if it's randomly done that can place a significant burden on, on the command and, and how to um, achieve that. So what I have done then is set out why I don't think that the random, random selection process is the best way to address this concern. What I suggest instead is perhaps a more modest proposal, but I think it gets to the heart of the, of the issue, and that is to revamp the way that peremptory challenges are exercised in the military system. And we all understand that peremptory challenges are a feature in the civilian justice system, they're a feature in the military justice system, but they, they allow either party, the prosecution or the defense, to in essence challenge members off of a jury or members off of a panel for no reason other than they don't want that person to sit. They don't have to have a, have a causal basis for that. Well, in the military under Article 41, currently each side, the prosecution and the defense, each get one peremptory challenge is all. Um, but interestingly, if you look uh, another line of jurisprudence that deals with peremptory challenges deals with, uh, with Batson, which is a Supreme Court case that held that, um, that prosecutors could not use the peremptory challenges as a subterfuge for uh, racial discrimination. Well, the military has uh, adopted, where, because it's Supreme Court precedent, military, the, this Batson jurisprudence has been imposed on the military. But when, when it, the, this Batson jurisprudence became part of the military, the interesting thing was, is in my research, I discovered that uh, the protections that the military provides under Batson are much broader than the, the Batson protections found in the civilian system. And part of the rationale for that, that the courts have articulated, is that because of the unique way that panels are selected in the military, uh, Batson protections need to be more robust. So what I've done basically is take that, that rationale and that analysis and apply, apply that to this broader question of peremptory challenges. So the proposal that I've come up with to hopefully resolve this issue of making a more a system that's both fair and has the, um, uh, le the uh, external legitimacy of seeming to be fair is to do two things. Step one would be to eliminate the prosecution's ability to exercise peremptory challenges. 
And I think that, frankly, it, to me, seems rather obvious because if you think about it, and I, I didn't come up with this, but there have been former judges on the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces who have noted that, in essence, the government already has an unlimited number of peremptory challenges in how they exercise their Article 25 criteria. They've already decided they can, who they're going to let on, on on that panel in the first place. So if a prosecutor is exercising yet one more peremptory challenge, in essence, they're saying that the convening authority, the one who exercised his Article 25 criteria, didn't get it right. And I don't think that's, I don't think that's accurate. I don't think that a prosecutor should have that authority, frankly, overruling the convening authority's decision on that point. So step one would be to remove the, uh, the one peremptory that the uh, prosecutor has. And step two would to be to give the defense a greater number of peremptory challenges. In essence, by, do by so doing, we're not, we're not removing the commander's ability to select panel members under Article 25. We're not taking away any of that convening authority's authority to run a courts martial. But what we're doing is we're giving the defense some more say in the selection process by giving them a greater number of peremptory challenges. Now, with respect to the number you give, um, this is kind of another unique feature of the military justice system. Uh, in a general courts martial, and that's a courts martial that can impose any punishment, other than a capital case, the number of panel members that have to sit to decide the guilt or innocence and punishment is five. That's the minimum quorum that's needed, is just is five members. In a special court martial, which is a uh, a, it's a jurisdictionally limited court that can only impose a year's uh, confinement on a soldier. The maximum no or the minimum number of panel members you need is three. Now, typically, what happens now when a, when a convening authority selects panel members, he might say, "Okay, if it's a general court martial, I have to get at least five. He may choose eight or nine, anticipating that uh, some of them may be t bumped off for challenges for cause or peremptory challenges, but he doesn't want to go below that." magic number of five and, and break quorum, because if he breaks quorum, then you have to go back and start the whole process again and convene additional uh, members to sit on the case. So what I propose is for general courts martial to give the defense attorneys three peremptory challenges, and in a special court martial to give the uh, defense attorney two peremptory challenges. In, in essence, what that gives them is the authority, kind of a veto authority over an initial panel selection that a commander would make if they elect to select just the minimum or close to the minimum number of members. And so if a commander is concerned about going below quorum, my thought or my, my thesis is that they will be more careful in who they select so that they don't invite these peremptory challenges and run the risk of having to uh, go below the minimum number required to decide the case. Or the other alternative is the commander may decide, well, to avoid going below quorum, I'm just going to select 10 or 12 or 14. And I still think that inures to the benefit of the defense because you have more jurors to select from. And if the commander is in fact trying to manipulate the process, that becomes more transparent. For example, if you have a five or six member panel and it just so happens that four of the six happen to be very senior ranking and in the same unit and in the same chain of command, a commander might attribute that to if, well, it's just a fluke. But if you have 14 who have that same dynamic, then it's obviously more transparent as to what the commander is trying to accomplish there. So uh, by, by giving the defense attorney the ability to exercise additional peremptories, I think that allows the defense to have a greater role and a significant and important role in the selection process that they're frankly at this point shut out of. And it does so in such a way that it preserves what I believe is the essence of what a commander's responsibility is under our system, and it preserves his or her authority as the convening authority. It's operationally more effective, um, and frankly, it's easy to implement. We don't have to establish some new convening authority or some additional system in which to make this happen. We simply have to amend Article 41 of the Uniform Code to say, prosecution, you get no peremptories, defense, you get three in a general court martial, and two in a special court martial. And uh, in, in my opinion, that I think would provide the symmetry that we need, that would respect the role, the important role that a commander has, that it would make, ensure that uh, jurors are selected in a more fair manner and that um, courts martial uh, have a greater theme 
or, or, or a greater le legitimacy than they currently do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, well, we are a little after schedule, but I don't want to give too, too much short shrift to the panel here, so I'm just wondering if we have time for maybe one, one or two more questions. One or two, not more, but one or two questions from the floor. For Professor Hansen, would it be possible, do you think, to come up with some type of computer program? You'd assign weight to the Article 25 factors. You, you know, assess weight based on the officer or enlisted record brief. You'd put it into a computer, and it would perform the Article 25 selection. Well, I mean, that's that's certainly a way. But I, I, I mean, if you look at the criteria themselves, I mean, I don't know how you would assign any quantitative weight to those. I mean, they're very, they're very broad in, 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 the, in what, the, what they are. But I, I would be against that because I think it does remove, I'm really, I'm, I'm really opposed to something that removes the commander from the system. And I, I don't, I, I think it, putting them into some computer program, in my opinion, would just add the appearance of objectivity, but I don't think it would achieve anything, frankly, because I don't know how you'd weight those criteria in any meaningful way. Another? Yeah. For Major Newhauser, I wonder how well your proposal uh, goes with commanders. Uh, has the, have, have your proposals been floated to commanders? Has, has there been input? It, it briefs well to a legal audience, and it briefs well, I, I suppose, to, to an American population that wants to, to support soldiers. Uh, but is this something that commanders seem receptive to? <coughs> I can just speak to my experiences uh, at Fort Carson. I'm the advisor uh, to Evans Army Community Hospital, and when I was in Germany, I was the one of the advisors to Launchstuhl, and no, they're not a big fan. <laughs> um, uh, commanders, you know, like I said, we are do something people. We want all the information. We all not, we want all the data, and we want to be able to control for all of the variables. Um, so they see themselves as being put at a disadvantage if they're not allowed to access these records. Um, well, and actually, I'm just going to, I mean, it seems, given what um, Professor Hansen said, that if, in fact, the buck stops with commanders under our, you know, that's kind of how we've, uh, what we've processed from things that have happened in the past, I can, I can actually understand that reaction. And, and you know, it's true, we, we place a lot of weight on uh, those commanders. They have a very heavy burden to, wear, to bear, but at the end of the day, it's a cost-benefit analysis. How often is it gonna be that the commander's gonna access that particular soldier's mental health records and prevent something uh, like uh, Major Hassan or uh, Sergeant Russell from happening? I, I think those instances are few and far between, but how often is a soldier uh, going to be say, saying to himself, I need help, but I don't want to lose my clearance. I don't want my buddies to find out. I don't want my commander all up in my business. Um, I think that's far more common. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're um, going to take a short break. Is that right? And then the Topol lecture.